immediate problem for Haggai in 520 BC was the rebuilding of the house of God, which serves as a metaphor for the broader principle of doing the work of God in all its forms. Now to conclude that the people of Judah, or the people of today, have adequately responded after they've erected some kind of material structure is to miss the point altogether. Let's take a look at the message this delivers to us here in the 21st century. Hi, I'm Pastor Tom. This morning I want to consider the message in God's initial word to Haggai that sets out two key ways in which we, just like the remnant returning from exile, can be involved in renewing the work of God. Now, number one, by refusing to offer our excuses. This was the first time God's voice had been heard since the days of Jeremiah, and he here refers to them as these people, not my people. Haggai 1-2, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say at the time, say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. The gap had widened between what God expected and how his people were actually living. Their excuse for not rebuilding was the long time during which he had not spoken. To them, it was God's fault. How quick we are to find excuses to blame God when we haven't done the work he's given us. And more often than not, our excuses are just a pretext for being lazy and investing time and money into our own projects, our own wants. Now, number two, we'll spend a little more time on this one. By not setting our priorities first. God's response struck right at the heart of the issue. Haggai 1, 3, and 4. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in, the par in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? The rebuilding of God's house should have had a priority over the work of their own houses, even as it must take priority over our own work. This was a barometer of their spiritual condition. How could they expect to call on God when they refused to do what he commanded? They were, in fact, inviting God to reject their own work, and his response was loud and clear. Verses 5 and 6. Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you, are, you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. God's work was to have a prior, priority over anything the people were selfishly doing for themselves. And there's a lesson here for all of us. No one cheats God without cheating himself at the same time. Now, I want to spend most of the time together on this key point. There is a correlation between the productivity of the land and the spiritual growth of God's people. It started in the Garden of Eden when God cursed the land because of their sin. That isn't going to change until Jesus comes back again. But look at Romans 8, 20 and 22. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. In the interim, however, healing can and will come every time God's people experience a major revival and return back to him. But far too often we complain that, I'm less satisfied. I work harder and yet I get further behind in my bills. I can't do as much with my salary as I used to. But I think we miss the point. God is trying to get our attention. If in studying his word we can't or don't want to hear his calling for us to return to him and put him at the top of our priorities, then we should not be surprised at his response. All too often we've placed other goals and interests in the place we should have reserved for him. Soccer games, job promotion, leisure, leisure time, you fill in the blank. The priorities we set in our daily lives are a testimony of the time we spend following the world's way. I want it my way. Everything revolves around me. Now God called Judah and he's calling us to make a radical break with his thinking and planning and make his ways his cause, and his goals are number one priority. In reality, 
doing anything else violates the second commandment. Do not practice idolatry. Let's stop giving God scraps of our time and energy. Let's start obeying him and doing his will. If we'll honor him, he'll stir up by his spirit, stir us up by his spirit and enable us to enable us to do his will by working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Zechariah reminded us, 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Our moment in history may be the most critical one of all. Are we going to experience revival or revolution? In the midst of the angry voices in government and the public square, will we hear his calling for his bride to be different from the non-believing world? Let's ask God to renew our hearts as we repent and turn to him. That is the only hope for this world until we meet Jesus face to face. So our challenge this week is to take stock of our priorities and make sure they have what God is calling each of us to do and allow him to make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, thanks for joining us here each week. And if you haven't subscribed and liked us, please do and help us all to stand up in this difficult time and step out as his ambassadors to our world. So until next Wednesday morning, remember, I'm here to help you on your journey from the cross to spiritual maturity. Now have a great week in Jesus and God bless.